The Life and Adventures of James P. Beckworth Narrator's Introduction and Comments On the north side of the Sierra Valley, in northeastern California, is the town of Beckworth, formerly Beckwith, until it was changed in 1932 to more appropriately honour the name of its founder. It lies east of the Plumas National Park and is about 22 miles from the Nevada border. It has no more than 10 streets, and Main Street runs parallel to the Feather River Highway. Other than the high winds in the valley, only vehicles on this artery can be heard as they pass through, not stopping, and whip up dust that settles on the adjacent houses and roads of this inconspicuous little settlement. To most Californians, let alone most Americans, it is a forgotten town. Its founder was James Pearson Beckworth, a fur trapper, mountaineer, and a man of many adventures. He set upon California almost as soon as the territory had been seized by the United States in 1848. He first established a store in Sonora, booming with prospectors from the discovery of gold, but this was short-lived. It was not lack of ability or inexperience in trade or negotiation that led to his store closure. He had more time honing these skills in the American West than most, trading furs and other goods with whites, natives and Mexicans for almost 30 years. After so long on the frontier, the appeal of returning to ordinary civilian life is understandable. But settled life did not suit Beckworth well. He continued to follow the gold for a while longer. By 1849, he had travelled a little further northwest to Sacramento to play his hand at cards, where the profits he made from his quick venture were quickly invested in his inebriation and those of the company he kept at this time. It was reported by an observer, John Letts, and later published in a book aptly named California Illustrated, that he had taken the town by storm and, quote, had all the inhabitants drunk that were disposed that way, end quote. By this time he was about the age of 50, already surpassing the life expectancy of the average American. His body was weaker and more tired, having long lost the brawn of youth, but his mind was indignant that he was no lesser a man than when he had started his adventuring career. As a more casual occupation, he took to carrying dispatches to various locations in the New Territories. On one occasion, he was hired to pilot a caravan of government mail to Santa Fe, New Mexico. But when the accompanying officer confronted Beckworth about his present condition, he rebutted, quote, in the strongest language, that he considered himself full as good as some men and better than others, end quote. The result was that he was put in iron chains. This was perhaps the greatest dishonour and humiliation that he might have felt, though he never expressed this in his own words, making scant remarks about these years of his life in his own memoir. For Beckworth acted and spoke as though he were always free, but his natal condition was that of slavery. Without truly knowing what his thoughts and feelings were on the matter, however, it is difficult to judge if this was the wake-up call that he needed to return to the mountains where he was most himself. He did reflect years later, however, that these were the days of, quote, rankest excesses, what honest men there were became alarmed, and frequently would abandon the richest places for the mere security of their lives, and leave a whole community of rowdies to prey upon each other. Disorder attained its limit, and some reactionary means would naturally be engendered as a corrective to the existing evils. End quote. How quickly after this brief episode did he become an honest man himself and move away from the boomtown cities, the dens of debauchery that represented fires of a very distorted kind of settled life that California was experiencing during the gold rush? He did not leave the state, however, and nor did he need to. Seeking out a place to call his own on the east face of the Sierra Nevada. There, Beckworth established a ranch, 
trading post and hotel opportunity placed to cater for the needs of the new 49ers flowing into the state, those who likely had just passed through Reno, Nevada. It was a compromise. He knew the outpost tied him to the land, no longer giving him the liberty to roam as he once did. But it was also placed in a sparsely populated valley surrounded by a mountain range with many trails yet unexplored and unmapped by Euro-Americans. There was still adventure to be had. But as already noted, he was not the only American to venture into California, seeking to change their fortune and establish new lives for themselves. By 1850, the population of California was about 92,000. Ten years later, this figure had increased by fourfold. This radical demographic shift was not evenly distributed, but concentrated in the boom towns, such as those visited by Beckworth. San Francisco, for example, had only around 1,000 inhabitants in 1848. By 1870, almost 150,000. For many, especially those like Beckworth, who were not used to the developments of rabbit uh, urbanization, such an extreme transformation could feel disconcerting and disorientating. Not that our protagonists would admit such weaknesses. Life in the American West was n by no means slow and could in fact be witness to sudden changes that affected the dynamic relations and livelihoods that indigenous peoples, African Americans and European Americans shared in this space. But the transformation wrought on California is not a comparable experience. Whilst the gold rush certainly brought with it ex the excitement of terrible risk and dramatic transition characterised by the dawn of a new era, it swallowed the whole social fabric an ecosystem maintained by indigenous tribes of their area and its previous Mexican settlers. This was neither an economy or environment in which Beckworth could feel at home. One can find sympathy with those seeking to escape the rankest excesses after having shortly arrived and with, and with those whose previous ways of life was now unrecoverable. Of these newly arrived opportunists, half of these arrived via the Panama Isthmus, the other half overland. Of these migrants on foot, few had any knowledge or experience of outdoor living, let alone having the know-how to survive and travel in the uncompromising terrain of the American West. In winter, the Sierra Nevada range was and still is an unforgiving landscape. By far the expert survivalist with few equals, Beckworth knew how to live outside the relative safety of settled life and therefore knew of the many sufferings that could inflict on the unprepared. Quote, the many worthy citizens that have crossed the plains. End quote. He remarked with detachment at their losses. Quote, much stock is lost in crossing the plains through their drinking the alkali water which flows from the Sierra Nevada, becoming impregnated with the poisonous mineral either in its source or in its passage among the rocks. There are also poisonous herbs springing up in the region of the mineral water which the poor famishing animals devour without stint. Those who survive until they reach the valley are generally too far gone for recovery and die while resting to recruit their strength. Their infected flesh furnishes food to thousands of wolves which infest this place in the winter and its effect upon them is singular. It debilitates their warm coats of fur and renders their pelts as bare as the palm of a man's hand. This general loss of cattle deprives many of the poor emigrants of the means of hauling their lightened wagons, which, by the time they reach my ranch, seldom contain anything more than their family clothing and bedding. Frequently I have observed wagons pass my house with one starveling yoke of cattle to drag them, and the family straggling on foot behind. 
numbers have put up at my ranch without a morsel of food or without a dollar in the world to procure any. They were never refused what they were asked for at my house, and during the short space that I have spent in the valley, I have furnished provisions and other necessaries to the numerous sufferings, sufferers who have applied for them to a very serious amount. Some have since paid me, but the bills of many remain unsettled. Still, although a prudent businessman would condemn the proceeding, I cannot find it in my heart to refuse relief to such necessities, and if my pocket suffers a little, I have my recompense in a feeling of internal satisfaction. End quote. It was perhaps another one of these bereft travellers during the winter of 1854 and 1855 that Thomas D. Bonner, an itinerant justice, met with Beckworth's generosity. Although the exact circumstances of their meeting are not recorded. Upon their meeting, however, two very different worlds collided. Beckworth, whose name carried with it notoriety by the diverse inhabitants of the mountains and plains of the American frontier and the borderlands, often without formal or written legislation, sat across from Bonner, a lawgiver estranged from his home far away on the East Coast, a house of the American civility and democracy. It is not known whether Bonner was entering or leaving California, and far less is known about his own life, but it is perhaps reasonable to assume that he was commissioned to the newly acquired territories of the American Republic. These were the forerunning years of the golden era of cowboys and Indians, gunslingers and saloons, bandits and runaways, and desperate prospectors looking for precious metals. Bonner may have worked beyond the typical brief of his counterparts on the East Coast, no longer dealing with petty crime and misdemeanour. He was instead very much a keeper of the peace, bringing law and order to the New Testaments of the mostly rowdy men. But of all these men that Bonner might have encountered, the honest, the corrupt, and the perilously hopeful, it was the life of Beckworth that struck him the most and was compelled to record. Beckworth had caught Bonner's eye and his ears became pricked. Bonner had no doubt in his mind that, by sheer fate or accident, he had stumbled across a great adventurer. What would it mean to be a daring adventurer today, to become an intrepid explorer, to trespass into unknown territory, to go farther beyond any vestiges of human civilization, to seek a name for themselves, to be honoured and remembered? to be a source of inspiration for the next generation of pioneers. There are few places left to mark on the map of the globe. Perhaps this adventurer could wander deeper into the Amazon or Congo rainforest in search of uncontacted hunter-gatherers or new herbs and poisons that may be turned into medicine. Perhaps they wish to dive deep into the oceans, of which 80% is still unmapped and unobserved that they may find natural treasures in the darkest of trenches. Perhaps they will cut into the earth itself, explore vast caverns and prepare the way towards a subterranean landscape. Perhaps there are just too few pin drops left on the map to satisfy these adventurers and instead they will look into the celestial body above for a vision of their pathfinding mission. Space is already etched into our popular imagination as the final frontier for humanity, the great escape from Earth led by the entrepreneurial navigators of our age. 200 years ago, explorers also looked to the stars as a guide on both land and sea, except the adventure lay waiting far closer to home, to a young Euro-American living in North America, the great frontier was at his back door. Stretching from the Mississippi River to the Rocky Mountains, the frontier captivated the imagination of stay-at-home Americans on the East Coast. M James Felix Jim Bridger, Christopher Houston Kit Carson, 
John Coulter, Martha Jane Cannery or Calamity Jane, Thomas Fitzpatrick or Broken Hand, Meriwether Lewis and William Clark, Jebediah Strong, Smith, Stuart, Robert Stewart and William Lewis Sublet were all household names of a new generation of pilgrims from the Young Republic. These were just some of the explorers, frontiersmen, hunters, pioneers, mountain men, traders and trappers, whose adventures, whose adventures are remembered as highlights of a time and place of almost unique excitement and danger in a setting of American natural beauty. Such tales of these adventurers weave in and out of myth and reality, the legends of their lives so often glamorized in the arts, forgetting that the other half of the story of the American frontier is one that ought, but infrequently is, voiced by or on the behalf of indigenous peoples of the region. To point out the obvious, the Wild West, to give the frontier another name, was neither wild nor westerly for the numerous Indian tribes that called it their own. Exactly how many tribes lived in the region from the period of 1800 to 1860 is unclear. But today, the U.S. government formally recognizes 343 Indian tribes within the contiguous United States. The, frontier, the term frontier is, however, as appropriate to the native peoples as it was to the white settlers encroaching on the vast territory. Tribe fought tribe, native fought settler, and slaves were exchanged between parties as the moral cost of human life was cheap in such a dire realm. Allegiances and borders between peoples were tenuous as betrayal and violent blows traded as eagerly as fur, horses and gunpowder. Depictions of Native Americans, trappers and adventurers, as well as formal military interventions by the United States government have all been romanticised at one time or another through art, literature and film. But at the core of all these betrayals is the solemn truth that life on the frontier for all was a test of hardship and regular violence in an era of rapid transformation of a continent and the development of the most powerful nation today. The adventurers of this age, such as those already mentioned, acted as agents for this monumental change. Whilst they worked and lived alongside any who might offer them the prospect of coin or shelter, their moral motives were complex and varied. Some acted in good faith with their native neighbours, others worked for selfish interest perhaps living just to survive in the hope that one day they may return to civilised life and settled existence. Others also worked in direct cooperation with the US government to dominate the region, seeing that the advancement of the Republic was an inevitable and unstoppable force that they could benefit from. For some all three motives were valid at different stages of their pioneering lives. Regardless of these motives, however, what is true is the idiom that tough times breed tough men, and whatever their successes and flaws, these were remarkable individuals. Dressed in buckskin head to toe, with sturdy shirts and leggings and rough moccasins, trilled in native fashion, the picture of both the common and idealised American mountaineer of the 19th century is easily recalled. Leaving the mundanity of East Coast life, pre-industrial American life, they were hard grafters and hunters of profit and became expert survivalists. Many writers have tried to capture the spirit of the age, but few do it better than Thomas Bonner, who in 1856 wrote, Buried amid the sublime passes of the Sierra Nevada are old men, who, when children, strayed away from our crowded settlements, and gradually moving farther and farther from civilization, have in time become domiciliated among the wild beasts and wilder savages, have lived scores of years wetting their intellects in the constant struggle for self-preservation, whose only pleasurable excitement was found in facing danger, whose only repose was to recuperate, preparatory to participating in new and thrilling adventures. Such men, whose simple tale would pale the imaginative creations of our most popular fictionists, sink into their obscure graves, 
unnoticed and unknown, end quote. The final words of this paragraph, however, offer a solemn reminder that so many men of the American frontier, the great majority who were driven in pursuit of fame, fortune and destiny, have fallen by the wayside in public memory. It is a sad fact that the memory of important deeds slip away over generations unless monuments are erected in their honour. The speed at which this happens depends entirely on the relative importance that societies place on such accomplishments. Take, for example, the adventures of recent history. In 2019, a study found that over half of millennials could not recall the names of Buzz Aldrin or Neil Armstrong as the first two astronauts to land on the moon. In this vein of poor awareness, most soldiers go undecorated, the words of most writers lost, the songs of ancient peoples forever unheard, the hands of most artists unseen by the majority of humanity, the people behind street names unrecognised. How then is the frontier remembered today? In European societies, much of the importance and interest that the American West held quickly faded with the loss of imperial ambitions in this sphere following the independence of the United States and the subsequent purchase of other old world colonies. As one French writer, Pierre Noblet, said in 1860, for some time now you, the French people, have strangely distanced us in our knowledge of things in North America, end quote though the same could certainly be said of British, Dutch, and German, Portuguese, Spanish, and other European peoples who all contributed to the formation of the modern American continent. In the United States, however, the history of the frontier remains as hotly contested now as it was in the time of the American expansionism. Even the very concept of a frontier has come into disrepute a word that owes its gravitas to the historian Frederick Jackson Turner, whose frontier thesis still mires the academic discipline of North American history. The debates over the legacy of violence, the creation of new territories for the burgeoning republic, and its contribution towards shaping modern race relations cast a shadow over the discourse of the frontier, even if the word is appropriate to use. In these arguments back and forth, the study of the lives of intrepid explorers, traders, pioneers and native chiefs and scouts are so often substituted for discussion over more abstract concepts in the cultural, economic and political realms of inequality, imperialism and moral critiques of American history. Note as an aside that for the purposes of this biography, if the word frontier is used it is done so in a colloquial sense, referring to the geographical area in the North American continent in which the direct administration and jurisdiction of the United States did not have de facto control. The frontier is intended to be treated as a landscape in which cartographers, explorers, fur trappers, missionaries, native peoples, traders, among others, fought, negotiated and intermixed with one another in an exchange that affected the dramatic cultural, economic and political transformation of the continent. It was certainly not a medley of actors vying for possession of free land, as Turner might have put it. Certainly, the men of the frontier, such as Beckworth, did not see it that way either. It was, however, a shrinking space as the US Army expanded its command through treaties, broken promises and war. As the frontier disappeared, so too did the raison d'etre of many of its protagonists, bound and trapped to a civilization which many had left voluntarily or avoided entirely. Such was the feeling of Beckworth as he left the cities of California. Where else was he to go? than the last vestiges of the frontier in the Sierra Nevada. As a student of history, I find that these appraisals of the past are both conceptually necessary and important for the continual revision of history. But as a layperson, uh, as I am now, 
and as are most likely uh, most of my listeners, the most widely understood definitions of such terms surely suffice. Having highlighted the stark differences between the remote wilderness and um, and the new and sprawling urban centres in Beckworth's own account, I hope it is clear it is clear to the listener that the use of the word frontier in this context should not be treated as a scholarly definition. Some aspects of scholarship have a tendency to overlook the lives of important actors or to embed them in wider movements, trends or environments where their agency is diminished or lost entirely. The great man theory can be uh, dastardly unpopular in academic circles. Such, then, is the role of biographies to salvage the lives of truly remarkable people, targeted mostly away from scholarly audiences. In this genre, many accounts have been written of renowned individuals of the American West. Indeed, Bonner transcribed the dictation of James Pearson Beckworth so that his life may not go, quote, unnoticed and unknown, end quote. But since the first publication of the biography in 1856, few have taken Bonner's lead in keeping the tale of Beckworth alive and relevant. Aside from a French translation in 1860 and subsequent reprints, there have only been one, there's only been one extensive biography of Beckworth by the late Eleanor Wilson in 1972, along with two other shorter published profiles. Wilson writes in the preface of to her biography, of the stories she remembered fondly growing up, that, quote, the old tales about Carson, the Bents, and the Backer family were standing law, but not without the mention, but not the amount the imagination of children. One could not help knowing that exciting history had been built around them, but in all those years I cannot remember having ever heard the name of James Beckworth, end quote. She continues commenting that when she did look into the matter, quote, almost every historian of the fur trade in the American West referred to Beckworth, sometimes quoted and checked his dates, and passed him off as a great liar, and that was all, end quote. As an exceptional investigative historian, Wilson did much to salvage Beckworth's reputation. In her appraisal of Beckworth, as a character, quote, suited to the making of a Western legend. She is perhaps too sympathetic towards him at times in her biography. Beckworth was certainly a man who thought well of himself, and it should be said that much of it was earned. Born a slave in perhaps not the least unfavorable circumstances, he acquired work in a trading company. Attaining greater and greater independence, he proved himself a worthy trader, warrior, and ally of the Crow Nation, eventually earning his place as a chief amongst their number. He was a master of language, and his rhetoric skill was certainly beyond comparison to his contemporary trampers and company. At times, his English was almost poetic, and throughout his many adventures, uh, he had become adept in multiple language, native languages and dialects, almost fluent in French, and could converse in Spanish. It was said of him that he could, quote, make himself understood in almost any language. And whilst his, this was certainly hyperbole, his linguistic proficiency was unmatched by most Americans. It is perhaps from his own tendency to prefer engaging narrative over infallible accuracy that was the course of his notoriety as a great liar. The publication of Beckworth's autobiography, as dictated to Bonner, was not without controversy when it was published, and he was indeed labelled a gaudy liar, a reputation which he never shook off. Consequently, and in spite of the extraordinary events and circumstances that unfolded in his life, little has been written about him. By comparison, there have been at least seven major works about the life of Kit Carson since his death in 1868, <clears throat> along with many other shorter biographies in histories of fur trappers, and the American West in general. As exciting as his autobiography is, there is a reason why autobiographies, autobiographies never do enough to sate the appetite of the reader or listener um, who is indulging in their lives. Much of a person's life, if it is 
to be examined requires analysis. It needs to be contextualized and critiqued, to be attacked and discredited, to be lauded and loved, in order, all in order to discover what is really true and false. For it is a natural response for those speaking or writing about their own lives to only show the world what they want everyone else to see. Furthermore, we have the added element of Thomas Bonner, who wrote down Beckworth's testimony and was responsible for its publication. Bonner's character as the uh, was hardly one of a faithful companion, and it begs the question of if and how many additional creative license um, 